everyone, and welcome to Preemie Chats. This is a place for healthcare professionals and parents to share, talk, and learn together. I'm your host for today, Jenna Morton. I'm a journalist living on the East Coast of Canada, and I am the mom of Preemie boys who were born at 32 weeks. Preemie Chats is a creation of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, also known as CPBF. The foundation is a parent-led charity that helps families during and after their NICU time through education, support, and advocacy. Please take some time to visit the website, canadianpremies.org. There you will find resources and projects. You will find links to our previous chats and our podcasts. And most importantly, you'll find a community of people, parents, and professionals who are working to help our children thrive. Our comment section is open, so please bring your voice to this discussion today. I think it's one that a lot of people are going to be very engaged with because today we're talking about mazes and minefields and how to seek psychological safety in the NICU. And to talk about that, I'm going to be joined by Kate Robson, who is a preemie parent, a former NICU family support specialist and a registered psychotherapist in Ontario. Welcome to the show, Kate. So nice to see you, Jenna, and I'm so glad to be here. I'm I'm so kind of emotional about today because my boys that I've mentioned, um, they just turned 10 this month. And shortly after they were born, a few months, about six months or so after they were born was when I met you for the first time. And so everything about this organization and about you and this topic today, it's all tied up. And thankfully for me, it's tied up with a lot of very good feelings and it brings me a lot of joy to be able to to hopefully share some ideas with people today about how they might be able to find some joy in their journey as well but i thought maybe we could start with you sharing a little bit about your journey as a preemie parent thank you and uh, and i do want to say i remember that and i can't believe it's been 10 years it just happens you know my goodness and and i have to say it feels kind of the same way for me you know i started off I, I didn't know very much about NICUs at all um, when I had my first child. She was a 25-weeker, a little 500-gram person, and she's applying to university now. Oh, my you know? goodness. I know. <laughs> I know. Time really does fly. It does. It does. And uh, and I will say that when we were in the NICU with her, I could not have imagined that, you know, what what was to come. And then and then I also had a second NICU baby who is now in high school, she's in grade 10. Um, and I was very lucky and I worked for a long time, about 12 years in an NICU as well uh, here in Toronto. And I loved it. I loved the families. I loved the people I worked with. Uh, and then more recently, I guess, you know how over the past three years, time has sort of become a case. It, <laughs> it, it was about four years ago, four and a half years ago, um, I made a move into um, psychotherapy. And part of what I've been doing as a psychotherapist, um, I, you know, I have a private practice, all kinds of people showing up with, with all kinds of um, stories to investigate and explore and process. But I do work a lot with NICU families. Yeah, and I love it. And I love it. Um, and I do want to just, I saw in the comments, Karen Herzog, who, Karen was actually one of our nurses. We called her the rock star before we knew her name because she was and is a rock star of a human being and a nurse. So it's it's really, I hope, Karen, you know how much you're loved and appreciated. Yeah. It's it's incredible those connections we make with the healthcare workers who take care of our infants and us when we're there. I know, uh, I think a few of our nurses are, if they're not watching, I know they plan to watch on the replay because they're still in our lives as well. And every now and then, yeah, you'll see someone's name pop up and you're just like, oh, or you'll see the face because maybe you didn't know their name. Yeah. And you're like, oh. Yeah. You... Yeah did so much for me. Yeah. You know, can I just throw in one more shout out too? Because it makes me think also of our, and I think probably a lot of families, this might resonate, um, that we had a primary nurse named Elizabeth, who she retired, I think, last year. And uh, we loved her. We continue to love her. Um, and, you know, for her and for any nurse, you know, nurses like Karen, um, you know, I hope you know you stay in our lives even long after we leave the NICU. You're these sort of, I don't know, fairy godmother figures, whatever kind of uh, name you want to attach to yourselves, as long as it reflects how precious and important you are and how influential and how significant, I want you to know 
how much you matter and continue to matter long after people leave, right? You know, you stay a big part of our lives. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like maze and minefields, should we dive in? Yes, I think we should, because I'm sure there are a lot of people who, uh, I can see there's a lot of people watching and I know a lot of people were, were anxious for this topic when it came up on, uh, on the previews. So yeah. you kind of came up with that, that name for today's talk, mazes and minefields. Maybe we start with a little bit about why you chose that phrase. Yeah, well, I love metaphors, right? Especially when you're dealing with something that's new and that you don't necessarily, you're like, what is, what is this? What am I experiencing? And sometimes metaphors or images help us kind of describe what it is that we're experiencing. People will, and, and there's a lot of metaphors that come up when we talk about NICUs. People often talk about them being roller coasters. And that worked for me because I hate roller coasters. You know? <laughs> but, but there's something about the unpredictability, this idea of, you know, of the uncertainty, of being kind of in this space of uncertainty for an, a certain amount of time. And it's, it's really challenging. It's really difficult on every level. And, and that's something I just want to acknowledge that the NICU experience, it's this sort of multi-system, multi-level um, experience for families where you are, you know, it's emotional, it's physical, it's so exhausting, it hits you financially, you know, it really hits every part of your life, every part of, of you as a human being is going to be impacted by your time in the NICU, right? And so, you know, it's interesting as we talk about, you know, seeking psychological safety, you know, is that a thing that we can find in the NICU? And spoiler alert, <laughs> I don't think we can, you know, that doesn't mean that we don't try. It doesn't mean that we don't seek to take care of our psychological well-being. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that NICUs are not inherently psychologically safe places for anybody, right? They're not safe for families. I don't think they're safe for staff. And I don't think they're safe for babies. And that doesn't mean that they're dangerous places, that they're bad places. They're wonderful places. But the stories that go on there are psychologically complex stories, right? And I think we have to recognize that. And I think the value of recognizing it is that if you are in an NICU, whether you are a family member or whether you're a staff member, and if you're finding it hard, you know, it's not because there's something wrong with you, right? You're right. Acknowledging that it's just a hard situation and a hard environment, I think is so powerful for yeah. especially people who are maybe just starting their journey or, or just trying to come out of that journey of the time spent in the NICU, trying to understand what comes next, which I, I think is a lot of who who really tunes into these preemie chats a lot mm -hmm. of the time or, you know, you have to get through that first little bit, but then it does, it, it does take some work to look back at what has happened and how you're going to, to, to deal with all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's been, you know, it's been a very great pr privilege of mine to work with NICU families at different parts, you know, of their experience. And so when people are in the NICU, I think it makes a lot of sense to really focus on, um, you know, getting through it, almost, you know, the, the word tolerating comes up. Like, how do we, how, do, how can we kind of just be with this experience? This isn't necessarily the time to do the major psychological unpacking, you know, of, of your organizing principles and your history and that stuff might show up. Absolutely. But I think when you're in the NICU, it's a time to pay the sort of beautiful, close attention to your own well-being to your physiological self, to, you know, connection to what, you know, we'll get more into this, um, about, about what you need on a day-to-day -day basis to be well. Afterwards is often the time to unpack and find meaning and kind of think, okay, why was this difficult? And, you know, what did I notice and what do I need now, right? When you're in it, it is such a, a all system, full body experience that I think it's absolutely enough to just think what helps me get through to tomorrow right mm. or even to the next hour yes. um, I, that was <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and and that's where i think it can be really useful to you know i often talk with families about um or lots of people who are in, in a space of transition when something really big is happening right that if if we're feeling really confused if something really big is happening we go back to these basics of you know sleep nutrition, gentle movement, connection, 
right? If we have these things, if there's some attention being paid to each of these things in our lives, we'll be okay, right? And sometimes that's that's enough. That's what we can ask for in that moment. Now, all of those things, if you're a family member in the NICU, it's kind of hard to access a lot of those things. Um, and I'm going to be kind of maybe pushy here or greedy or something. Even though it's hard to think about all these things, I really want families to think about all these things, you know? And it's hard because, you know, parents are pumping or, you know, they've got a kid in the NICU, they've got kids at home, they're being pulled in all these different directions. Even with all of that, I would invite, you know, you as an NICU parent to think about, am I getting, I'm not getting a, you know, the fantasy of eight hours of uninterrupted sleep a night. Am I getting enough sleep? Can I, can I survive on this? Am I, do I have an appetite? Can I eat things that, that both nourish me and delight me, right? Am I talking to people, you know, who feels safe to talk to? Can I reach out to them, you know? And, and I want to be clear here, when I say movement, I don't necessarily mean exercise, because sometimes people are like, <laughs> why would I want to do that? If you want to exercise, beautiful, you know, um, but just moving your body, right? And, and getting outside. Mm-hmm. Getting outside as much as possible. Although on a day like where I am, it's like really cold, so I, I get why people wouldn't want to. But getting outside every day is also really important for our well-being. I think it's it's important too to recognize those those differences too, and what <clears throat> what movement does feel good and what movement does help you. I know, for example, my husband needs that movement he needs that physical release of i need to go for a run on the treadmill i need to and even if it's 15 minutes that he can carve out it makes a huge difference and so it is important even though every like you say every aspect of your being is wrapped up in i need to be in this moment i need to be helping my child i need to be taking care of all these other things you can do those things better if you give yourself those 15 minutes to do what you know whether it's a walk outside or just to sit outside for 15 yeah. minutes yeah i love that you said that i agree so wholeheartedly um and i at 15 minutes yeah a lot of the, these things that can can help us especially in these really difficult moments they don't have to be huge things they don't have to be huge commitments the time commitments or energy commitments they can be very small things right 15 minutes five minutes it all makes a difference. And in fact, um, you know, we, we talk a lot when, when I do groups, we talk a lot about the value of these small steps, small moments, you know, we might call them bold moves because we want to get into the practice of making and keeping promises to ourselves. Right. Um, but they do not have to be big moves, right. They can be calling a friend. They can be getting the, the fancy latte from the second cup. They can be, you know, you know, and, and, Another thing that's kind of interesting to think about, so movement is, you know, getting five minutes of movement, 15 minutes of movement, whatever. The other thing that I really want to encourage people to do, and this is for, all of this goes for staff too, I should say, because, you know, they're dealing with a lot of difficult moments. They're dealing with punishing schedules. They're dealing with you know, so much, right? Um, but the importance of moments of delight, right? Yeah, so I, I was reading, um, uh, Mary Ainsworth was this wonderful scientist who, you know, our our modern understanding of attachment about the connection between um, infants and parents, you know, she was the one who really started focusing on that work. And she's a fascinating person. And um, one of the things that she talked about that really resonates for me is the importance of finding delight uh, in each other, right? So that idea of when a parent and a baby kind of really connect you know that moment that there is such deep delight you know that kind of oh you know um and those moments help build that attachment and that connection right and so i want to focus on these moments of delight for a few reasons one is that that's such a beautiful invitation to families in the nicu to find those moments of delight with their babies even when their babies might be looking you know very wee, very tiny, very fragile. What can you find about your baby that your baby may not look like the baby you were expecting to meet? Okay. Can you look at them and find something to delight it? Right. 
I remember a very beautiful gift a nurse gave us um, when we first met our baby and she was so tiny and she had no fat and she just didn't look like what I was expecting. And I did love her, but I didn't really understand her yet, you know, and um, this wonderful nurse, Bev, um, she was like, oh, look at her feet. She's a dancer's feet. And it oh, helped beautiful. me. It was so beautiful. And it helped me see my baby. It helped me see something beautiful about my baby. I was like, oh, she has a dancer's feet. And, and we kind of cupped her feet. And it was sort of that first moment of just pure delight, right? And that's the beginning of relationship, you know? So, so yes, so we find finding opportunities for delight. For staff members, the invitation would be, A, can you facilitate and cultivate those opportunities for parents, you know? And I, so many staff members do such a wonderful job, you know, making footprint art and doing special, you know, costumes for Halloween, all that stuff. That all cultivates delight, you know? I hope they find their own moments of delight in that as well. Because is there anything cuter than a tiny little baby dressed up, you know, as a ladybug or whatever? Um, and then the other thing would be, so there's the moments of delight between you and your baby, or, you know, or, you know, you and your partner, or, and those things facilitate relationship. And then there's also moments of delight that might be very personal. And those are equally important because they're, you cultivating a relationship with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and they feel frivolous. So sometimes I'm encouraging parents to, what feels delightful to you? Is there some, something tiny? Like, is it, you know, a, you know, a beautiful scented candle? I've got props. Um, <laughs> is, it, is, it, yeah, is it a wonderful lotion that you can use? Is it something that tastes delightful, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I don't have time to think about that. I can't because I, you know, I'm thinking about my baby. I need to be at the hospital. I have so much to do. And it's like, if, just as you said, you know, that exercise will help you do these other things, you know? Delight will regulate you. It will help you be more open to other things, right? So yeah, an open invitation for families listening. Um, please take some time for delight. Please take some time for joy. That's, that's uh, absolutely find joy in the NICU where you can. And don't feel bad about seeking it elsewhere, you know, about going to see a friend about going on a beautiful walk about, you know, whatever, whatever kind of elevates your spirit, even if it's just for two minutes, please do it because you really need it. Right. And, well, and I, I will say from experience that if you take the time to do it, even if you don't even realize consciously, that's what you're doing, then it will come back to you. Cause as you're describing, you're talking, I can hear a song in my head. <clears throat> and it was a song that I like discovered while I was holding my boys in the NICU and, you know, I'd be in the kangaroo care chair and you have to be there for as long as you can. And I was privileged enough that I could have a chunk of time that I could be there. And there was a particular song that I listened to on repeat. And, but it was, it was, that was the song that I was sharing with my boys. And it was that, you know, yes, I was able to do it holding them in the chair, but even if it was when they were still in the incubators, you can have and create those moments that that will get you through and that will be touchstones down the road oh, a decade yeah. later. Yeah, I bet that song when you hear it, it still oh, brings um, back. It does. Like I just I'm yeah, I'm filling up right now thinking of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and I appreciate you bringing I mean, for one, any mention of kangaroo care is important because kangaroo care is so important, you know, for the for the baby's well-being, for the parents' well-being, I think also for staff well-being, you know, to be able to f facilitate this amazing developmental experience, you know. But I think the other the other thing that comes up when you share that is, um, you know, if we acknowledge, so we're acknowledging that NICUs are really difficult places to be, right? And then we, if we kind of think about why, I mean, there's the obvious reason that you know, your baby is there and it's a place where, you know, babies who need medical help are, right? And so it's obviously going to be an emotionally charged environment. Um, and then also, um, you know, from a sensory perspective, right? Because human beings, like we're sensory beings and, you know, it's a loud environment. There are alarms going off, you know? And I say this with so much love, uh, appreciation for staff, but I do think it's kind of funny when people will say, you know, oh, just ignore the alarms. And it's like, well, you know, it's not really how alarms work. Like they're designed 
so that you don't ignore them. They're designed to to activate you so that your you know your your system kind of climbs up this ladder of activation. That's their whole job, right? So it's hard for for you know somebody says, "Don't worry about the alarms, relax." That's not going to work, right? <laughs> so. So I think this is part of this kind of radical acceptance of the fact that the NICU is a difficult place to be. You know, there's all the emotional stuff that's going on there and there's all the sensory stuff that goes on there. And if you are a human being, you will have a human response, you know, to all the sensory input. You will have responses to the alarms. You will have responses to the, to the smells around you. You know, the clinical smells of hand sanitizer, for example, right? That's going to have an impact on you. And it's not because you're frail or weak or that there's something wrong with you it's because that's what happens to human beings who spend time in environments like that right you're going to become activated that that's you know it's it's science <laughs> it's just science that's what's going to happen Lisa, it's so important though to, to know that that it is science it's not like you said before it's not a shortcoming of any yeah. one of us as an individual it yeah. is <clears throat> what our bodies are trained to do yeah. in these environments and and knowing that is the first step yeah in in being able to i don't know if accept is the right word but to to live with it to figure out yeah. how to how to coexist with it i like that that coexist with it i love that way of framing it yeah and then to think okay so if we if we acknowledge this is what so if we think about that ladder of activation right so our systems are going to climb that ladder and then we can think, okay, well, how do I climb back down, right? Now, I may not be able to get all the way to the ground, right? Because I don't have, and this is one of the things that's difficult. Like, it's an uncertain place. I don't have control, right? Um, I don't, you know, as a parent, I don't have control. As a staff member, I don't have control, right? So I don't have control. Um, so maybe I can't get all the way to the ground, but can I come down one or two rungs, right? What are the things that are going to help me come down one or two rungs to a place where instead of standing on top of the ladder with nothing to hold on to and feeling really like, ah, I can come down to a place where I can hold on and start feeling like myself again. Right. And those things can be really little, little things, right. It can be breathing. It can be deep breathing. You know, it can be talking to a trusted friend. It could be talking to a therapist, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's a good thing. <laughs> quite positive thumbs up on therapy um it can be it can be talking to a nurse it can be talking to a social worker you know and i just have such wonderful social workers who are so helpful um it, it can be moving our bodies right there's so many things that we can do to just help our systems come down this much mm -hmm. and, and i will say this is where the power of movement not necessarily exercise but gentle movement can be so important right especially um movement that crosses the midline so movements that are sort of like bringing attention to different sides of the body right so i can't really demonstrate because of where i'm sitting but so i'm gonna everyone's gonna have to imagine <laughs> um but so for example uh a long time ago there was a family you know so in some units um families are invited to be part of rounds right which is wonderful. It's a wonderful opportunity. Not all families want to do it. And that's totally fine. Like, you know, if it doesn't, if you don't want to be part of that, that's totally fine. Um, and then if you do, but you're really nervous, uh, this is something that can be really helpful. So if you imagine kind of standing as part of rounds and, you know, everyone's talking, you know, and you can kind of gently move from side to side in a way like, that's, this isn't so noticeable what I'm doing right now, right? No. You can see a little bit. And the, the other thing which you can't see is that I'm gently putting pressure. So my hands are on my legs, like you know, just flat on my legs. And I'm putting pressure on one side and then the other. On one side, then the other. And it's very gentle. That gentle, small movement is really regulating for the body, right? You know how little kids, there's a big thing about um, fidget toys, you know? <laughs> My house should not be just for them. Kids. Yeah, they should not be just for kids. They're amazing. Kids. But because they do, this is what they do for the body, right? All these emotions, these thoughts, these feelings, they need a place to go. I think that's the value, the beauty of that kind of fidget movement. It gives all of that energy a place to go. 
So it's the same thing with that gentle kind of sway back and forth, touching your legs. It helps channel energy in a particular way, and it really helps regulate the body. Well, and I'm just going to say too, that if you're in the NICU and you're kind of doing that, that bit of a sway, no one's going to think anything of it because I still catch myself doing that kind of movement after having kids for so long. And I notice other people do it and I've noticed people comment, oh yeah, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing the mom's way, right? You, you get in that habit when you're, yeah. you know, trying to, <clears throat> to calm a baby of doing that kind of thing. And so no one around you is going to wonder why you're kind of swaying back to forth because they've probably seen pretty much everyone there do it at some point. <laughs> 100 percent and no wonder we sway back and forth with babies because hey mm -hmm. what are we doing we're helping them regulate because they're having that that experience of movement right it's going to regulate us too right I, I never thought of that scientific part of it just the like you just kind of instinctively do it and i think it's it's so neat to know that there's there's more behind that than yeah. just a gut feeling of oh maybe if i move we'll feel better <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And and there's another exercise which I definitely can't demonstrate because I don't have the space. <laughs> but um you it's I think it it comes from like Chi Kung. Um but you so if you imagine kind of if you're standing up and you kind of kind of windmill your arms around and you kind of let your arms swing around you and kind of you know, one arm might kind of bang on on your back, you know, and the other one kind of touches your hip and then you kinda of go back around from and you're back and forth kind of like that. That is a very <laughs> regulating movement. You look right? like you're flossing. <laughs> the, the dancing kids do. <laughs> Maybe yeah, yes. you, you'll just Maybe look like you're a millennial. <laughs> flossing, is the secret, <laughs> flossing is the secret uh, uh, regulating regulating movement. The kids knew it before us. Um, but yeah, actually, I wonder. <laughs> but but so things like chi kung things. There's a lot of movements in that that are very regulating for the body. So, and that's where it's sometimes people have shared it. I feel such tenderness when people say this because they're like, oh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but it really helps me to do X. It really helps me to have a lollipop handy or a hard candy. It really helps me if I do this. I'm so embarrassed. It's so childlike. And it's like, what? First of all, um, if it works, beautiful. You know, there's no shame. It just, does it work? That's the question. But I also wish, you know, people will sometimes say, oh, I'm being such a baby. And it's like, what's wrong with being like a baby? You know, you mean you're getting your needs met or you're asking to have your needs met or you're expressing emotion openly or you're hungry and would like to be fed or you'd like to be taken care of? Like, what's wrong with that? Maybe we should all be like babies more often. I don't know. <laughs> I think babies are onto something. <laughs> so, so I want, mostly what I want to say is if you're noticing there are little things that help you, you know, and if they are still, you know, if they're aligned with your values, right? If they're things that are neutral or, you know, like sucking on a hard candy, you're noticing that helps you feel calm. Amazing. You know, go to Costco, get a big bag. <laughs> it's fine. You know, there's nothing shameful about noticing that, oh, these little things help me. Right. Because again, it's not about erasing the thing that you're feeling. It's about helping yourself stay in a zone where you can function, where you can do what you need to do. Well, like you said, just finding those those rungs on that ladder of, you know, if you can take one step down, yeah, that's better than taking one up. Yeah, absolutely. Because you are going to end up taking more steps up the ladder. That's that's how ladders work. You go up and then you go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, the things that, that, that sometimes things will happen that are completely out of your control that are going to push you up the ladder, right? Yeah. Um. You know, we've all been living through this. You know, it's so interesting. I, I feel I feel like maybe we've talked about this before, but it, it just feels appropriate now, especially because I have a cold as well. I haven't been sick for three years and I got this cold and and it reminded me of when I was in the NICU as a parent and, and feeling like a tickle at the back of my throat and being so afraid. What does this mean? Will I not be able to go in? You know? It's kind of like a lot of NICU parents, we've talked over the pandemic and been like, oh, yeah, we've been doing this since like, <laughs> you know, yeah. 2005. We, we know how to wash our hands. Um, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, there's, there's, it's a big lesson of these past few years, you know, that things can happen and can push us to the tops of our ladders. Um, and we cannot control those things. Um, but what we can do is invite in you know, into our own systems, into our own practices, into our own behaviors, we can invite in elements that will help us um, remain ourselves 
even in the midst of a really difficult time. That's so powerful. And just that thought of, of, I think a lot of us continue throughout our lives to struggle with that idea of of who we are. And that's important. I think to keep in mind as you're going through, if you're, if you're in the NICU, because you have just become a parent of a preemie, that's a new element of your identity now that of course you don't know how it fits in yet because it's new and and it's going to change. And it's something that, you know, obviously as, as we show it, it's going to stay with you. It's going to be part of how you see yourself for the rest of time. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. Well, you know, I love that you, you brought that into, cause it made me think of uh, um, a metaphor that I kind of like um, when I'm talking with NICU families about, you know, how are you going to hold this new piece, right? This new identity piece and, and to recognize that um, we can absolutely welcome it in as a new identity piece. And we have a choice about how we're going to hold it. Right. So, okay. Okay. Let me tell you my metaphor. <laughs> so imagine a whiteboard. Right. So and a lot of NICUs have these. Right. So you go in and and you'll have stuff written on the wall about you know what, how your baby's doing and, and what you need to do for your baby that day. And, you know, I exam it, too, or whatever. And years ago, a mom was kind of joking around, lovely mom, and she was kind of joking around with me. And she was because she when she had thought about becoming a parent. She had sort of imagined herself as kind of like a hippie mom rolling around in the mud, you know, and then she's like, oh, no, I'm weighing diapers, <laughs> you know, it's very different. Um, and, and it was such a nice conversation. And then years after, I thought about that and I kind of thought, oh, yeah, like we come into the NICU as parents and we have this idea of who we were going to be as, as parents and we have our own values and our own things that matter. And then we're part of this very different environment for a while. And and it probably runs differently, you know, so it's, you know, for me, like I was, I'm not a very routine oriented person in lots of ways. And you know, ICUs are routine oriented places. And so in order to exist comfortably within that system, I had to go along and be a part of that culture, right? Because NICUs have to run the way that they do, more or less, right? Um, I get that. But so when we go, when we leave, I think there's a really interesting moment we can kind of imagine taking that eraser and just kind of like, you know, we might not want to erase everything. There might be some things. In fact, there are a million things I learned in the NICU that I wanted to keep, but I could erase a lot of it, you know, and I get to start writing down my own things. Right. And I will full disclosure. I don't think I really did this until my kids were a bit older. I think I held on to a lot of fear-based parenting a lot of worry. There was a lot of anxiety in there. Um, and it, and so again, an invitation to NICU families is, you know, when you get home, maybe take some time and there's no rush, you know, but maybe take some time and really think, maybe talk with your family, with your partner, with anybody who's close to you, who you really trust and think about, you know, who do I want to be as a parent? What are, I was given a lot of gifts by the NICU. Some of them I will keep and some of them I can, I can, Put out of the curb. <laughs> you know, we don't have to take everything. I, I do remember quite gleefully going home and like, I'm not taking the temperature at every diaper change anymore. <laughs> those felt- are those fun little victory moments where you feel like, yes, you you are in control and you are going to say what happens now. And yeah. And yeah. it's true though, there are those little things that you'll take with you. <clears throat> I remember one of the things uh, I share this quite a bit with people when I'm talking about parenting, especially that I took from our time in the NICU was, I can't remember if it was one nurse or every nurse and every, you know, (laughs) neonatologist we had was, you cannot compare right now to what just happened. You know, if, if you start playing that compare game, it's always going to kind of eat at you that, you, you know, you've gone up a little, you've gone down a little, you have to like look back further, you know, look at where baby's weight was two days ago, Mm -hmm. you know, compare it to now one feed to one feed. You'll get lost in the details, but take these bigger steps and see what you're comparing to and look for those patterns that are happening the way you want to see progression happening. And throw 10 years now of parenting. That's been my like, you know what? Okay. Yeah. Today might not be so good, (laughs) but you know what? We're better than we were last month and if we're not well okay what 
what do we do then? But to yeah. not, you know, not to compare what has just happened and, and taking that personally, like as a person, as a parent, you yeah. know, making sure that you're not constantly, because I think a lot of us, you know, especially these days are very quick to to get down on ourselves and to look oh, at what yeah. other people are doing and, and compare ourselves to other people or, you know, other ideals that we might have had and being able to go, okay, you know, let's compare me to me and me five years ago, me five days ago is different than me now. Oh, yeah. And you, thank you for bringing that in. That's so important. I don't know who said, was it, was it Shakespeare? The Bible, Oprah, I don't know. The comparison is the thief of joy, right? Oh, good. Yeah, I don't know where that started, but it's true. Yeah, whoever said that, <laughs> two thumbs up, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's really, it's really, it's hard because our culture is all about that, you know? Um, but I do think it's, it, and the other thing is, like, we have no control over our thoughts or feelings, right? So those thoughts and feelings are going to show up, and that's okay. But I think when they do, and we notice... And this is the, the great work that can happen in therapy, right? This cultivating this capacity to notice without judgment, to just notice what is that we're thinking and feeling and then just kind of letting it be there, but holding it really lightly, right? So it's like, oh, I'm worried because my baby is, you know, X months and this other baby is X months and they're doing this. And just like, of course I'm worried, you know, worried and love, two sides of the same coin. What can I do right now that's going to help me feel connected to my baby and do that thing? The, the, the thought or feeling isn't the enemy, but it also doesn't have to take up all the space. It doesn't have to take up all the air in the room, you know? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I recognize the time I did want to just say, I see Carrie and Petya and Lori there. And I just, mwah, just want to send a lot of, a lot of love and big hugs your way. Um, and I know, you know, and I, I know we are, running into time and so want to make all kinds of room if anyone has questions or anything and then there was one grounding exercise i wanted to share if we if we have time for that of course we do yes okay sure. okay good so um so this comes from a type of therapy called emdr and i will say for anyone listening if you are it is very common for nicu parents to leave the nicu um you know with mental health challenges. I certainly did. You know, I struggled with some anxiety and depression afterwards. Um, and sometimes people will get diagnosed with something called PTSD, right? Related to the, the stress and trauma that they experienced. And so EMDR, um, and if you Google it, you'll be like, this is wild. This is, what is this? <laughs> you know, um, but look it up. Um, I did some training in it a couple of years back and it's fascinating, right? It's a way of helping the brain process traumatic memories so that they aren't kind of kind of hanging open in your life. They aren't kind of confronting you, you know? So sometimes parents will say, oh, I, I can't even go grocery shopping because I might see somebody pregnant. And when I do, I start getting the sweats. And it's like, okay, that is that sounds like a trauma response, right? So if you're noticing stuff like that's happening for you, um, again, your brain is trying to protect you. Um, and you can probably help your brain file those memories away you know, in a way that's a bit, um, makes it easier for you to live your daily life, right? So there's all kinds of therapies that can help with that. EMDR is one kind, brain spotting. Oh my gosh, there's like all kinds of therapies all over the place. So for one, I would love for you to take that seriously, you know, not in a time like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm broken, I need fixing. It's like, no, but this is, this is something you could get help with, you know? So if it's troubling you, absolutely talk to somebody. And I think, you know, you could probably feel better. And for now, um, one of the things that, you know, in EMDR, they do a lot of uh, resourcing. They teach people, the idea is you, you teach people a lot of skills to help them regulate, to help them take care of themselves. Um, because, you know, processing, you know, traumatic memories can be hard work. And so one of the, one of the exercises that I think is so beautiful and I found personally really helpful is called the Calm Place. And so that's what I thought we could talk about just for a couple minutes, right? I would love to know more about the calm place. Okay. It sounds kind of like the calm place. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually very lovely. So what it is, so what I would invite, um, you know, I, I won't put you in the spot to have to do it, but what I would invite anybody listening, and I'll sort of share, you know, what came up for me when I first did it as we talked through it. But we want to imagine a place 
And this can be a real place or it can be a fictional place, an imaginary place, but a place where we feel really calm, where we feel really good. Um, and if it's a real place, I would ask you to find a place that's kind of uncomplicated, right? So sometimes people will be like, oh, the family cottage. And then then they kind of think for a bit. And it's like, oh, everyone's fighting about the family cottage. So it's like, no, <laughs> you want a place that's really, that 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 you you really just feel calm, right? And so people might come up, you know, I'm on a beach or, you know, I think of this screened in porch, you know, a house I used to live in. But there's all kinds of images that can come up. There's no right or wrong here. So by a lake, on a mountainside, at a museum, you know, in, a, in your own bedroom, it's all good. And once we, once we decide what the calm place is that we're going to explore, the first thing that we might do is say like, so in your mind's eye, what do you see, you know? And if I'm in my screened in porch, I might, I might see the screen. I might see a barn over there. I might see some birds. I might see green grass. I might see the hammock. And then the second thing would be to, what do I hear? And so I might hear wind. You know, if I'm imagining a beach, I might hear seagulls, um, whatever, whatever gentle sounds, again, that feel maybe kind of delightful, kind of enjoyable. I might hear music. I might hear the hum of people talking. Um, anything that kind of that, that belongs in that place and that, and that doesn't disrupt this feeling of calm. Right. So what am I noticing when I when I listen? Um, I might reach out. Again, in my mind's eye, um, I might feel, you know, on my screened in porch, I might feel the edge of the hammock. Um, I might feel the screen itself. If I'm in nature, I might run my finger on a beach. I might touch the sand, right? Um, smell what comes up, you know? In my screened in porch, I might have a really nice cup of coffee, <laughs> you know? Um, if I'm at the seaside, my goodness, so many beautiful smells. Somebody the other day was like, oh, I'm at this cottage and the snow is melting and there's that wonderful smell of spring coming. So nice, right? Um, taste, we can invite a taste in. So maybe I have like, I don't know, butter tart <laughs> with me or, or a hard candy or, or that coffee. And so what we're trying to do is to create this kind of beautiful place in our mind's eye and then really go through our senses one by one. And then, and just really try and inhabit that space. And maybe we give that space a name. So I have screened in porch. Somebody else might have, you know, cottage by the lake, right? We want to give it a nice catchy little name. Then once we've established this, we want to practice, right? So maybe before we go to bed, you know, we're just lying in bed at that kind of nice moment just before we tip over into sleep. And we might say to ourselves, I'm, I'm just going to visit. I'm just going to visit my screened in porch, you know? And the reason we want to practice is because we want to access this resource. We want to access this practice in moments when we're stressed. So if we only ever reach for it when we're stressed, um, that's when we're stressed, that's not the, the easiest time to, to acquire a new skill. So it's nice to practice it. And so we practice it. And now if you're doing EMDR, there's a whole other part to this, but we don't even need that other part for this to become useful, right? So you have your calm place, you've given it a name, you've really explored it, and now it's available to you, right? You practice, you might think of it, you know, you're having a shower, you keep practicing, and then it does become available to you. So for example, like my favorite place is not necessarily a doctor's waiting room, but now I have this resource for myself. So I can just be, you know, sitting there, I can be feeling stressed, and I just think, you know what? I'm just going to go hang out in my screen in porch for a while. And so maybe my, my stress level was at sort of like at a seven out of 10. And I spent five minutes or less just kind of thinking I'm down at a four. Ah. Talk about coming down a ladder, right? Mm -hmm. So that's my invitation to people listening, you know, take some time, whether you're in, you're in the NIC or not, you know, whether you're a parent or a staff member, you know, I think this is a useful tool for anybody. It's also great for kids, right? This is a thing you can do with your own children. Um, 
so you have this available, this beautiful place available to you. You don't have to book tickets. You don't have to spend money. <laughs> you can just go there whenever you want. And it can be really, really helpful. Hmm. You make it sound so peaceful and beautiful. I'm like, oh, I want to go visit your porch and I want to go <laughs> visit the beach. And I just want to go. Even that idea of that, <clears throat> that smell when the snow starts to melt. Like the, there is, there are these. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, it is. It's so powerful when you take the time to go through each of the senses and layer yeah. all of that on it. It makes it so real. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of this, Kate. Um, I know we did uh, we did say hello to a few people in the comments who uh, who have shared just how wonderful you have been in helping them, and that uh, you know therapy has been a great tool for them as well. Um, if there's anyone else who wants to you know to to drop anything in the comments, whether you're watching us live now or you're watching this on the replay, please do, and uh, <clears throat> you know keep this this conversation going because I'm sure there are a lot of people who have a lot of you know tips and, and tricks that they've come across over their time like you say both as you know staff and as parents trying to to navigate the nicu yeah and and i would like to um i think probably a lot of people watching this are already members of the online support group um mm -hmm. if you're not if you're an nicu parent who lives in canada there's such a wonderful online group part of facebook um it, you know Canadian Premium Parent Support Network, I think it's called, but you know, we'll put a link in the comments. It's a great place. It's such a nice group, such nice people. Um, I find it a lovely, safe, supportive environment. Um, lots of people who understand what you're going through. Because I think that's one of the hard, well, there's many hard things about being in the NIC with your baby, but one thing that's hard is it can feel very lonely. And so if you are out there feeling lonely, please reach out. You know, reach out. You can reach out directly to the foundation. You can you know, join the group, but you are not actually alone. There are a lot of people who are just waiting for you. Um, and I, so I really hope, yeah, reach out. Don't be alone. Um, and join. There is a, a fabulous community of people ready for you. You know, that's true. It's it. You know, everyone's journey is going to be a little bit different. No one's yes. going to have exactly the same experience as you, but. But there is this fantastic village of preemie parents of, you know, all ages. Now we have lots of, you know, parents who's like you said, your your girls are getting ready for university and high school and, <laughs> you know, like, and all different, you know, all different steps along the way. And I know <clears throat> the foundation quite often will uh, will share highlights of, you know, people that we might recognize for their athletic achievements or their, you know, authors and musicians who started off as preemies. And I know it's, it's always fascinating to know just how big the community really is when you think of it that way, that you, you're not alone. Someone might not know exactly what you're going through, but they know what it's like to go through it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, thank you so much, Jenna. It's always a pleasure to connect with you. It's always so wonderful to speak with you, Kate, and I hope that uh, everyone continues to to join in for these. We'll um, we'll be back again next week with another chat. Uh, next week's chat is focused on uh, supporting siblings when you have someone in the NICU. So that's going to be fantastic. And I would just like to put out a reminder for everyone that uh, Premi Chats does happen here every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And you can go back and watch this episode and all the others on the website, canadianpremies.org. There's lots of other resources there as well. And we'd like to thank everyone who supports the organization. It is a charitable organization. Its mission is to empower families of premature babies along every step of their journey. And uh, we are thankful uh, particularly to AstraZeneca, the Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses and FICARE for educational funding support for this series. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you again soon.